They say there's a garbage patch <laughs> twice the size of Texas. <laughs> and what I have to say is go ahead. Make my day, bag monster. <laughs> Stop right there. <laughs> 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 Have a Chico bag. <laughs> yeah, he's dead. Um, as a kid, like a lot of kids, I dreamed about exploring the ocean. I dreamed about being a marine biologist. Um, I had my childhood heroes, which were Jacques Cousteau, Evil Knievel, and Dr. J. And when those are your childhood heroes, the obvious conclusion is that you become a sea turtle biologist, which is what I've done. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to follow my childhood passion, my dream, and track turtles around the world. I, I'm kind of a turtle geek, I guess you would say. I see turtles where sometimes they aren't really there. Um, <laughs> Some of you actually look a little turtly today. Uh, this is a turtle that was there just for a split second, and it's gone. Never, ever coming back. But to me, that's a sea turtle. I told you, I'm a turtle geek. I love turtles, and I spend my time and my career following turtles and working to save them around the world, our beautiful ocean planet. Back in 1996, however, I tracked the first animal ever across an ocean. This was a turtle, a loggerhead turtle, in Baja California, Mexico. We named her Adelita after the daughter of the fisherman that helped us put the transmitter on her, and she swam off into the distance. And we were really excited to see where she would go. Lo and behold, she took off like a shot and swam 12,000 kilometers across the Pacific Ocean. Now, this was 1996. Nobody had ever tracked an animal across an ocean before. Amazing thing. It took her 368 days to reach Japan. We shared her track on the internet with people all over the world. Here's the bad news. She swam right through an area now commonly known as the garbage patch, Pacific garbage patch. I learned about the garbage patch in 1996 while Adelita was swimming through it, and I worried about her every single day. I started calling oceanographers learning about the garbage patch, learning about the turtles out there, what they might be doing, what's out there about all this plastic, and I got very, very concerned about the plastic in the ocean that could harm our beloved sea turtles. It got worse. I've traveled the world to sea turtle nesting beaches, and sometimes on those beaches what we find are piles of plastic. The turtles literally have to claw their way through the plastic to get to the sand. They have to climb over the plastic to get to the places where they're nesting. And once the baby turtles are born, if they can get up through the sand, avoiding the plastic in the sand, out into the ocean, they're very lucky. But sometimes they get into the ocean and their first meal is plastic. That's wrong, but that's our reality. Some turtles survive it. They pass the plastic through their bodies. We've saved countless turtles from plastic by just simply pulling it out of them. It's not what I signed up for. And most recently, I traveled to the Gulf of Mexico to join the sea turtle rescue team in response to the oil catastrophe. Some of the worst days of my life. Turtles covered with oil are some of the saddest moments of my life. Uh, devastating experience. It's just absolutely wrong. So it turns out that my childhood dream translates to second worst job in science, right between hazmat diver and elephant vasectomist, according to <laughs> popular science. And the reason why it ranks so poorly is because there's some bad, bad news about the ocean. And it comes at us relentlessly, daily. And it's not just about plastic, but plastic is the issue why we're here. Oil and plastic together dominate our planet. And that's the problem we face today and right now, at this point in, in our history. 
We consume and consume and consume, and we ship things back and forth across oceans and across our country. A lot of that stuff is plastic. A lot of the things we drink are, are inside plastic bottles. We use plastic bottles all the time. We've heard about that today. We ship plastic bottled water across the ocean, and we ship it back to be recycled on the other side of the ocean. It's kind of insanity. All of this plastic still exists, by and large, on our little blue planet. And if we keep going in, in this way, you can see where we're headed. Exponential growth of plastic, which is the dream of the industry, it's not going well. We will end up living in Plasticville if we aren't already. Is that what we want? I don't think that's the future that we want. This is a moment of opportunity. The opportunities facing us right now around this issue are enormous and frankly exciting and invigorating if we choose to take them. We need to rethink our ocean, and we're doing that. We have an explosion of ocean science right now coming from every direction. In fact, the, the World Ocean Census, they're finding spe new species all over our planet. It's very exciting. We're, our new understanding of the ocean is absolutely exciting. It's a very exciting time to be an oceanographer and a marine biologist. We need to rethink our food. We need to think organic. And that's happening, but we're in the midst of that revolution. We need to rethink our, our relationship with the ocean and seafood. We need to make our choices very, very carefully, because the future depends on it. We obviously need to rethink energy and explore all of the options, including wind, solar, and perhaps ocean energy. We need to rethink how we get around. We need to rethink our vehicles, and that's happening. It's a very exciting time. And I beg you, don't buy another car until you can get one that doesn't run on gas. Sign up for that pledge, too. We need to rethink how we think, and we're doing that. Modern cognitive neuroscience is exploding. We're in a revolutionary time. We're understanding our own brains in ways we never have before. We used to think about the brain as being a black box. We don't anymore. We now can look inside our own brains, right down to the neuron level. It's an amazing time to be alive. We used to understand that emotion and reason fought with each other. They were in a constant battle, pulling in opposite directions. But we now know that emotion and reason work together, and there's no other way to be. Emotion and reason work together. There is no reason without emotion, the neuroscientists tell us. And we used to think about this epic battle between fear and love. It's not fear against love, it's fear and love. There's a reason why we're afraid of certain things. Put it together, emotion and reason and fear and love, all at the same time. That's what it is to be human, all of that together. And if you need the scientific citation for these points, feel free to look it up. It's there in the literature. My childhood hero said, if we were just logical, we'd be in big trouble. But we're not. We're so much more than logical. That's exciting. Now we need to rethink our plastic. We need to think from this philosophy of cradle to cradle. You make something, you're responsible. Design needs to be convenient and responsible. Right? That's the essence of cradle to cradle. You make it, you need to know where it's going, you need to figure it out and take responsibility for that stuff. I consulted with my in-house design team named Grace and Julia. They're available for hire, they're eight and five, and they live with me. And I said, how would you solve the plastic pollution crisis? And they thought about it a bit, and they said, we would redesign the cup. And we would make it out of an origami recycled wax paper. And I said, that is an amazing answer from the minds of children. They just said, we redesigned the cup out of a piece of paper. Seven steps, and you got a cup. Amazing. Now, my friends over at Monkey Business, Mike Patton, they're redesigning skateboard parts, and they're getting rid of the plastic components. So these are called risers, and you use those in your skateboard. And if you're a skateboarder, you know what I'm talking about. They're making them out of bamboo instead of plastic. They're rethinking skateboarding. Now, if you go into the supermarket, you find in every single aisle, mostly what they're selling is liquid wrapped in plastic. And the number one ingredient in most of the things in most of the supermarkets in the world is water. Okay? 
Then we take these bottles of basically water and we truck them around in diesel vehicles. We put them in open face refrigerators powered by coal and they sit there until you say, I'm thirsty. I want orange soda pop now. Right? What a ridiculous design. Absolutely ridiculous. You know why? One of the reasons is, at least in the US, water is one of the best distributed substances we have. You're never more than 10 steps from a, a, a water tap for your, almost your whole life. Think about that as you go through the day. Water is never far away. So we need to rethink our drinks. And what does that mean? That means we need to call, it's called smart water, dumb water, because it's dumb, because it's in a plastic bottle and shipped around in diesel trucks and refrigerated until we get thirsty. There's nothing smart about that. We need to understand that ha happiness does not come in a bottle. We need to rethink happiness. Happiness comes from somewhere very, very different. Don't let anybody convince you otherwise. Universities around the country are banning plastic bottled water. And you know what they're doing? They're not getting thirsty. <laughs> they're not walking around saying, ah, man, I'm so parched. They're coming up with a better design. They're solving the problem in a responsible, convenient way. The bulk food areas of our, our supermarkets are expanding. Every time I go to a supermarket, the bulk food area is bigger. Why? Because people want responsible design. They want to refill their own containers. Farmers markets exploding around the country, all over the place, from the cities to the country and everything in between. So we understand that the solutions aren't necessarily going to come from right in the middle of the, the problem. We know that solutions come from other places. Solutions come from independence of mind and capital. Right? So we look for the innovators who are thinking independently and have independent sources of funding that do not depend on the status quo. So my challenge to the people who make stuff, the manufacturers of the world, is think carefully. Think more. Rethink what you're making. If you want to make stuff, think carefully about what you're going to make. Think about where it's going. Come up with a convenient, responsible design and employ it. And I'll tell you something. There is a network of people, mostly women, a lot of moms. They are ready to back you up. They are ready to buy what you're selling. They are ready to do free marketing for what you've got. They're ready and waiting to catch that ball. It, it's an exciting time. We've got this global network of people who are completely activated. They want your product. So if you make things, this is your time. We live on a beautiful planet. Rethink our use of plastic. Rethink it from the ground up, cradle to cradle. We need to rethink everything. This is our time.